So what is it like to try and start a wildlife rehabilitation center from the ground up? Maybe some of our listeners are working towards that same ambitious goal. So what does it take to be successful and make that vision a reality? Well, first you have to have a lot of drive and a lot of passion. You have to have a support network that is behind you and believes in you, and you have to be organized. One group of ambitious wildlife warriors are doing just that. They saw a critical need lacking in their community in Northern Colorado and took on that challenge, but it hasn't been easy. And they are still working towards that ultimate goal of opening a wildlife rehab center. My guest today will discuss what they have learned in the first two years of running their nonprofit. He'll share with us what is working for them and what they wish they had done differently. I am equally interested in this topic as Rocky Mountain Wildlife Alliance turned one year old on April 1st. And I know all too well the challenges of starting a nonprofit. So thank you for joining us for My Wildlife Style Radio, a podcast series for busy wildlife professionals like wildlife rehabilitators, educators, and veterinary staff. I am your host, Emily Davenport, and I am the founder and executive director for the Rocky Mountain Wildlife Alliance. Our mission is to elevate the care and protection of Rocky Mountain wildlife by fostering a sense of community and collaboration among wildlife professionals. I am very excited. Today, I am here with our guest, Talon Nightwalker, fully licensed wildlife rehabilitator and vice president for Northern Colorado Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. When Talon was just five years old, he started volunteering at a wildlife rehab center alongside his father in Fort Collins, where he fell in love with the profession. Once he turned 18, he received his wildlife rehabilitation license from the state of Colorado, and he was able to take another step in his career and begin working as a licensed wildlife rehabilitator at Greenwood Wildlife Rehabilitation Center in Longmont, Colorado, where he has been working for the last five years. He also received wildlife, forestry, and natural resources recreation certificates in 2014. In addition to working as a wildlife rehabilitator, Talon has worked as a veterinary assistant and wildland firefighter and personal care provider for the elderly. Talon, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. So how did you get started working with wildlife? Yeah, you uh, hit it spot on. When I was, you know, really young, I was lucky enough to be able to come in uh, after school with my dad and spend a few hours there and, you know, just you know, start cleaning dishes or sweeping, you know, floors, you know, of course, I probably spent a lot of time on the computer considering I was five. (laughs) Um, But as I was able to get older, I I grew my skills and I got stronger and I was able to do uh, pretty much everything that the other folks there and other rehabbers were able to do by about 10 years old. Um, in, In exception to, you know, handling the raccoons and larger animals and then I didn't euthanize or handle the bats but and then uh, you know but I was feeding baby birds baby raccoons you know hauling water Uh, you know we were lucky enough to do not only the wild animals the birds mammals reptiles and amphibians but also be in charge of the barnyard and exotic animals just because we were part of the humane society very cool. So your your dad is obviously a wildlife rehabilitator. So that's kind of where you started jumping in at a young age then. Yeah, exactly. And a, about 2000 is when he started his career as wildlife rehabber as well. Right on. Your dad is awesome, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. So that's really cool. So you've really kind of been around wildlife for your entire <laughs> life practically. So what made you fall in love with wildlife rehabilitation? I enjoyed being able to give back. I enjoyed being part of the solution rather than the problem. The fact is that probably about 90% of the animals we see at a wildlife rehab center are human caused injuries or avoidable situations. And I just wanted to be part of that solution and be able to help directly save animals lives and, you know, do something worth doing. Absolutely. I think, you know, that's a reason a lot of us get into this profession of wildlife rehab in particular, but also wildlife education. And I I read a really interesting statistic recently that in Colorado, 95% of wildlife that are injured or orphaned can be attributed to accidental or intentional human interference. So you're absolutely right that, you know, most of the animals we're seeing are are caused by by humans. Wow. I didn't actually... uh think it was that high but yeah and obviously that varies you know 
No, it's not surprising. But that's that's great to have that statistic. Yeah, really interesting. So Northern Colorado Wildlife Center was started by several wildlife professionals trying to help the community fill a need. So there's actually a, a lack of this resource in your area. Um, the only non-raptor wildlife center that was up there closed down in 2012. Yeah, uh, Wildkind was that facility and that was the facility that my dad was in charge of as well as the one I grew up in. And unfortunately, it was part of the Larimer Humane Society. And so they governed us. And in 2012, they did abruptly decide to focus on domestics sure. and close their wildlife program. And this left about the 3,000 animals that we did every year without help. Wow. And, you know, the tragedy helped my dad and myself really decide to go ahead and start one of our own wildlife centers and you know, we are still in the startup phase but hopefully in the next year or two we will have a fully functional wildlife rehab center to serve Larimer and Well counties as well as the other areas as needed. Awesome yeah and you know that it's actually a common problem that I think happens around the United States. I've heard a lot of humane societies that did domestic and wildlife kind of move on from the wildlife side of things so it really leaves a, a, a loss of a resource um, with that community. I know that's, that's often a shame when uh, a humane society kind of shuts down that wildlife component of things, but you know, out of a negative situation, it really sounds like you guys are trying to do something positive. So can you, can you tell me a little more about uh, the, your mission? Yeah, yeah. So Northern Colorado Wildlife Center's mission is kind of three parts, especially now that we have our 501c3 status and are officially an independent nonprofit. Uh, but the first two parts of our mission we have actually achieved, which I'm very happy about. Awesome. Um, the first one is in regards to education and talks about how we want to educate the public about not only peaceful ways they can coexist with wildlife, but also humane solutions and just solutions in general to human wildlife conflicts that we've done a ton of especially through facebook and our other social media accounts is answering questions and being able to answer calls about you know just human wildlife conflicts the other aspect that we have achieved is the part of our mission that reads that we want to promote and advocate for the preservation and restoration of native ecosystems and allow animals places to live and thrive and we've already done that, not only through the education I just mentioned, but through, you know, for example, last week I just helped with a flood debris cleanup project in nice. one of Loveland's natural areas. And uh, we were able to clean up probably about five tons of debris wow. and really open up the natural area to elk and deer and fox and some of the other large animals while still leaving pockets of you know, debris for the rodents and snakes that benefit from it. So that was just one example of how we were able to achieve that part of our mission and help restore an ecosystem back to a very balanced state. Because, awesome. you know, as we all know, being wildlife lovers, a balanced ecosystem is a healthy ecosystem. Absolutely. And, and was that from the 2013 flood? Yes, yes. So, so, so for some of our, our listeners who don't know, Colorado and, and particularly northern Colorado suffered an a incredible flood back in 2013. They were calling it a 500-year flood, I yeah, think. And, they were. Yes. And really wiped out, uh, decimated parts of um, northern Colorado and um, a lot of our wildlands were destroyed. Um, a lot of our canyons and, and even just our roadways getting to and from places were pre tore up so that's awesome that you were able to be a part of that cleanup yeah, of course yeah it was very incredible and um and then the third part that we are working towards right now of our mission is to build a facility and be able to rehabilitate the sick injured orphan wildlife that uh, share our community with us and you know until we can get enough funds and enough donations that is really on standby so you know as soon as we have funds and the donations to do it we will open up a wildlife rehab center and take care of sick, injured, and orphaned uh, birds, except for raptors, small, medium-sized mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, and bats, and, um, and be able to achieve the third aspect of our mission. That's awesome. And, and for me personally, I, I feel like that's so important um, because we have lost so many wildlife rehabilitators here in Colorado. 
um, I was looking through an old study that was done um, by a rehabilitator for Parks and Wildlife. And in 2002, there were 117 wildlife rehabilitators in the state of Colorado. Today, there are 23. Oh, man. So, yeah. so we are in desperate need here in Colorado. And, and I'm sure there's other parts of the country that are like that as well. No um, kidding. So wow. really hopeful that you guys continue to do well. Um, so, so whose idea was it to start a rehab? up north obviously there was a need but but who who's i whose bright idea was this originally it was my dad's bob nightwalkers um like as i mentioned before he was in charge of the facility in fort collins and uh you know besides losing his job he really you know was heartbroken to see so many animals left without yeah. somewhere to turn so it was originally his idea but within a few minutes of a conversation i was on board with it of course nice. and then we were able to uh, bring two other rehabbers, Josh and Julie, nice. that live in Fort Collins. We brought them on board. And, you know, after that, we really decided that we were going to make this happen and go forward with it. And we grew our board of directors. We were able to incorporate and then achieve our nonprofit. And, you know, once we had the first year of kind of the paperwork foundation set, we you know, we're able to open up the education and outreach departments of our organization and really do everything we can possibly do right now with the resources that we have. That's awesome. And, and I, I want to jump back to uh, your first year in establishing your nonprofit uh, in a minute, but I'm, I'm really excited for you guys that you've been able to open up that education side of your nonprofit. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and what it took to kind of get that going and, and what's been working for you guys so far? Because I, I see a lot of posts on Facebook and it looks like you're doing a lot of outreach. So that's awesome. Yeah, we were extremely excited when we were able to open up the education outreach aspects of our organization. And, you know, we all share the common belief that education really is the first line of defense Absolutely. against wildlife being injured or orphaned and we are all volunteer run even the board directors are all volunteers so you know it's tough but we wanted to do everything we can with the resources we have and you know education lets us do that and so we have done uh, probably about eight to ten events so far wow. the last you know six to eight months since we've That's officially great. opened it and we've talked to a wide variety of audiences, school children. Uh, we've talked to CSU and Front Range Community College up in Fort Collins. And, you know, we even have some really great boot events coming up. We have the Earth Day Fort Collins booth, which is going to be on April 21st in the morning. And then later that day, we have our fundraiser at Max Line Brewing called Night for the Wild from 3 to 8 p.m. Uh, and then later in May, we've scheduled ourselves for the Water Festival in Fort Collins. And there we will be talking to 1,800 uh, third graders. And we'll discuss uh, aquatic wildlife ID, but also how they can help preserve water ecosystems and you know things like not dumping chemicals down drains and picking up fishing line and things like that. So we're very excited with that. Uh, in accord with this, we have also been able to bring on our first volunteers. Right on. So we now have two volunteers, one I brought on a couple weeks ago, and then one I actually just discussed right before this interview. Oh, right on. And so, yeah, and both of them have some amazing, incredible education outreach and wildlife rehab experience. So, you know, the education and outreach aspect of our organization is picking up a ton of great positive forward momentum, and we are all extremely happy to see that. Yeah. That's great. So I know we jumped ahead a little bit, but that seems to be like one of the things that are, are working for you then and helping you gain that momentum that you guys have needed in your first couple years. Is that fair to say? I would agree. It's awesome. working extremely well for us and uh, we're anticipating the rest of our adventure to go nice. just as well. So Awesome. Awesome. So back to basics, back to the foundation. So Let's talk a little bit about what were your steps to establish a nonprofit. As most of our listeners know, um, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy at all. So, so how did it go for you guys? Well, you are definitely correct in saying it's not easy. Uh, it's a much harder than even we anticipated. We thought a year or two and we'd have a fully functional rehab up and running. We'd yep. be self-employed and, and doing great things. 
Um, but here we are about two years into it. And, you know, even though we have made so much progress and had so much success, we are, you know, still cutting through all that red tape. Um, but first, you know, after we had our dedicated team in place, it was a lot of background research, just figuring out the little things like how to create articles in a corporation and bylaws, and then finding the best way to apply for a nonprofit status with the IRS, and just a ton of paperwork, uh, which was great because it set up a great foundation. You know, once we had that foundation built, we had to teach ourselves even more skills. You know, how, you know, to build a website, to you know, social media pages mm -hmm. and, and, you know, managing our time efficiently. You know, I pulled, you know, I, more than I would probably like to admit, you know, I pulled a lot of all-nighters just sure. teaching myself self stuff, watching YouTube videos, you know, making phone calls, you know, really learning how to wear, you know, 10, 12 different hats. Um, but it was, you know, it's all worth it. It was all success. And, you know, after we had all, you know, even that stuff in place, uh, we were able to be lucky enough to have some people on our board, like Carrie Rotola as our secretary on the board, but she has a ton of experience in running nonprofits okay. and, you know, she's been a lifesaver when it comes to a lot of the stuff that we're self-teaching ourselves, um, you know, and she's been just really fantastic and generous with what she's done. Good, because I know for me, um, I didn't know anything. You know, I, I knew enough to be dangerous about nonprofits when I first started this. And if it wasn't for a couple key members on my team that knew a little more than I did about nonprofits, I don't know if I would have been able to sift through all the paperwork, so. No, you are, you're spot on, you know, and, and thankfully after all of us, you know, putting thousands of hours of hard work and research mm -hmm. into Northern Colorado Life Center, you know, we are at that point where we've opened up the education outreach portions and, uh, you know, helping our mission really hit the ground um, running. But, you know, even now, now with, mm -hmm. with that added success, I'm having to teach myself how to sure. be a volunteer coordinator and yeah. how to schedule events. And, and so it's, it's never ending, but I can promise that it will be well worth nice. all the hard work. And you said something really important at the, at the beginning of um, that last question is, you know, you, you thought you would be so much further ahead than, than you are right now. But I, I did the same thing when I started Rocky Mountain Wildlife Alliance. And I think it's so important that those of us that are starting new nonprofits, especially in the wildlife rehab realm, is don't lose sight of all the things that you have accomplished um, in that first year, in those first few months, in the first few years. Because even though you're not where you hope to be, you're still light years further than where you were, you know? So I think, I think that's all something we can be very proud of, the things that we've done. But, you know, what would you say, what would you say has been the hardest part? You know, as much as I've loved it all, um, I would say none of it's been easy, you know, cutting through all the red tape and learning the, you know, wear all the hats isn't easy. But if I had to narrow it down to just one thing, I would say finding a property has been the sure. hardest part. And that's kind of why we you know, have saved it towards the end of it, um, even though we've been working on it this entire time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just we've looked at a few and, and it's just finding something suitable for wildlife rehab is, is not easy. Nope. And then even after you have figured out a property and found one, then you have to go through the zoning and planning process, which is 10 to 18 thousand dollars and eight months all on its own so mm -hmm. you know you're that far out always but you know i have been extremely surprised with how generous our community is and i'm sure once we can raise enough funds and donations you know, we'll be able to find something you know even if we have to build it we'll build it absolutely yeah i i, I absolutely have faith in you guys you have a good team team working towards this um, kind of along the same lines we've been talking about, you know, in past podcasts and, and anytime I talk with individuals, I talk a lot about creating a network of support. I think that is so important for those of us um, who are in the nonprofit realm, but more importantly, in the wildlife rehabilitation realm as well, as we have to have that network of support. Um, and I assume you've kind of touched on this already, but do you have a good system of support for uh, Northern Colorado Wildlife Center? I would say so. You know, I would say we have a great network of support. You know, just within our board, we we have you know my dad who is just a wildlife guru that's been doing it almost twenty years, 
you know, we have Carrie that I've already mentioned. We have Kate, another, another board member that is amazing with technology and, and really helped us get that up and running. And then, you know, just every single person I've talked to in the community it wants it. You know, just mm -hmm. I talked to the city of Loveland volunteer manager the other day and, you know, she was telling me how much they miss having somewhere to bring animals sure. and miss someone that can educate. And, you know, luckily I'm helping her with that part, but we're not helping her with the wildlife part of it yet. Right. So I would say we have a great network of support. Good. That That's so important. And, you know, not only do you have to have that network of support within, you know, your friends and family members, but you also have to have that support within uh, your professional realm as well. And so reaching out to other organizations, reaching out to other people in, in similar fields, I think is just critical to to our survival in, in this realm. I would agree. I, I think the, the one piece of advice I could give mm -hmm. to the listeners is to have someone to lean on and, and have someone you can talk to. And, you know, that way you can help keep your separation because as much as we all love working with wildlife, it is very difficult at times. And, you know, the more people that you have in your network of support, the less likely you are to get burned out. So definitely, it is important. It is definitely. Important. So we've talked a little bit about the pros and cons of starting a wildlife nonprofit and you know, you got to take the good with the bad. What are some of the obstacles you guys are facing right now? You know, as much as I hate to say it, money and budget is our biggest obstacle. I think most nonprofits deal with that too, especially wildlife nonprofits. I would agree. I would totally <laughs> agree. You know, luckily since we are all volunteer, you know, we're not using any of the money we've raised. We've probably used maybe $75 of That's the great. last year and a half of donations. Wow. So you know, we are paying all of it out of pocket when we can, but you know, it is important that we make sure all the donations go straight to getting a facility up and running as soon as possible. So, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the money is the hard part. You know, it's hard to get people to donate to an idea, mm -hmm. which luckily now that we have our education outreach departments going, we have some tangibility, but in the past, yeah, people said, yeah, I really want this, but mm -hmm. I, I, I don't feel comfortable giving money, which is... I think that's a really good point because a lot of um, rehabbers and educators out there, they, they have this vision. They have this idea for something, whatever that something is, and they can't understand why people won't, won't give them money for it. But, but you're absolutely right that that is a good bit of advice that you have to be able to prove something to the community. You have to be able to show them that you are offering a service. And so sometimes it may not be the original idea that you had, but it, it kind of coincides or, or parallels nicely to, to the ultimate vision. I would agree. You know, this has been, this whole adventure has been more fluid than mm -hmm. we would originally have expected. But, you know, yeah, I mean, I just try to assure everybody when I'm asking for a donation that it is all going towards us finding a property to rent or buy, applying for those zoning permits, or, you know, even improving our education outreach abilities and, you know, the education supplies and stuff. But, you know, I want them to all know that we aren't personally making money off of this. You know, right. we've all put hundreds, if not thousands of dollars into it. And, you know, I just, unfortunately, we are at that point where we are relying on other people's mm -hmm. donations. And, you know, but like I, you know, said earlier, we live in such a generous community that I don't foresee that we won't achieve it. Definitely, definitely. So along with that, what is working for you guys currently? There's obviously a lot of, a lot of good along with the, the tough things as well. There is. And, you know, luckily the good things have far outweighed the bad things by just an exponential amount. Totally. And, you know... I would say that we are moving forward very quickly. We are picking a momentum every day. Um, you know, luckily about six months ago, we did, decided to open up the education outreach portions of our mission. And uh, we, you know, I would say we are doing everything we possibly can with the resources that we have right now. And luckily education outreach eventually helps animals down the road. Mm -hmm. So even if we don't have our hand on with gauze on it, you know, holding pressure to a bloody wound, we are helping animals, you know, just by telling kids, you know, cut up the six pack containers, pick up the fishing line, talking to homeowners and telling them, put up a fake owl instead of shooting that animal, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, it has just been phenomenal what we've achieved and 
how happy people are when they have somebody to turn to for these wildlife problems that they never even thought they would ever encounter. When there's you know multiple birds hitting your window or a fox just living under your um, deck, mm -hmm. you know, there. I mean, it's not easy to deal with, and people don't think about it until it's happening to them. And so, luckily, you know, through social media mostly, we have been able to provide answers to those people and 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 help as many animals as we can right now. Yeah, I think um, you can probably relate to this being from the veterinary field as well. That that's what my background is was in I was a veterinary technician for for eight plus years and um, you know as much as what we say we do is you know working directly with those animals and, and performing surgeries or, or you know doing wound management or pain management what we're really doing is education it's very true you know, I, yeah I mean I love I love being able to interact with the animals and you know be in a field chasing down a goose that has a broken <laughs> wing or you know, being on a kayak, going after a duck with a hook in its throat. But yeah, I, I would say that mm -hmm. arguably some of the most beneficial things we do, we do educating the public, you know, even in a facility, working with volunteers and interns and educating them and mm -hmm. so yeah. that they can grow and, and go on to bigger and better things and, and help who knows how many animals down their line. You know, I would, I would agree. I think Educating is one of the biggest parts of our job. Definitely. And before I forget to, you mentioned some of your social media uh, outlets. Do you want to mention those to our audience at all? Yeah, definitely. I would love to. So on Facebook, you can find us just typing in Northern Colorado Wildlife Center, or you can look up at NOCO Wildlife Center, and we're on there. And I would say that would be your best bet. That's what we're using as our primary outlet. You can also look on Instagram using at NOCO Wildlife Center as well. And then if you want to check us out on our website, it's going to be www.nocowildlife.org. That's really great. Thanks for sharing that information. Um, you guys really are doing a lot of great things up north right now. And um, I love the vision that you guys have. Can you talk a little bit more about the vision for Northern Colorado Wildlife Center and their, your idea for caring for a wide range of animals? Definitely. So our our long term vision is to essentially mimic what Wildkind did. So we're hoping to be able to rehab all the birds except raptors, mammals up to the size of a coyote, including the bats, as well as reptiles and amphibians. Nice. There is a ton of need up there for them, and you know, especially with the bats and the reptiles and amphibians, there's not a lot of places in the state that take care of those. That's true. It's true. And I think it's kind of that way across the board throughout the country. Um, but you kind of have a soft spot for reptiles. I mean, I think most of us animal lovers love reptiles as well. Um, but, but you have a special affinity for them. And um, originally when I approached you, we were kind of going to talk about uh, reptile rehab. So do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. I do have a soft spot for them, um, especially rattlesnakes. I When I was at Wildkind, I really enjoyed taking care of them not you know not only the wildlife you know as such as the rattlesnakes bull snakes gar snakes but you know also like the you know six feet 16 foot reticulated pythons mm -hmm. and you know the ball pythons and all of them as well so um but i i just i believe that they're very misunderstood especially when you consider how much good they do for the ecosystem you know they keep rodent populations in check which you know in turn lowers disease and and they do just a ton of good, yet everybody's always just afraid of them. So, you know, I was very lucky to be able to grow up taking care of them. And uh, I do a lot of work with them outside of my work in rehab and outside of my work with Northern Colorado Wildlife Center. You know, if I see them on the road, I'll move them off. I'll Definitely. move them off trails. I have helped countless people get them out of, you know, window wells and everything. You know, of course, sure. I use a snake hook and snake tongs with the venomous guys. But, you know, yeah, I mean, they're just so misunderstood, yet they're so beneficial and so harmless people are just people just have the wrong con misconceptions about them and, and it goes back to kind of what we were talking about before it, it's all about education it's about educating the public about about who they really are what they really do and, and the benefit they provide for that for the ecosystem yeah i agree you know i think one of my favorite education memories is bringing my own my, my personal ball python to the boys and girls club in loveland and giving a presentation and then at the end I brought her out and 
you know, so many of the kids like would pet it and be like, it's not even slimy, yeah. you know, and uh, just little things like that or, you know, these people that think that they're evil because the Bible says so. It's just, you know, I want to break those barriers down and show them like, no, you know, mm -hmm. you can hold this snake and it won't bite you. It won't do anything. And, you know, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love educating about reptiles. Awesome. No, I do too. I think it's so important. And, and lastly, before we close up, I got to ask you, I'm really intrigued about your um, work with uh, wildland firefighting. Um, are there any parallels to fighting fires and caring for wildlife? And, and are you still doing that as, as a part of your extracurricular activities outside of NOCO? I am, you know, I am just uh, finished up all my annual refresher, refresher fitness tests for okay. my firefighting. And there are some su surprising parallels. You know, I'm going into my fourth year being a firefighter nice. and then my 17th year being a wildlife rehabber. And, you know, just, it's amazing how, how much things line up in the world. And I would say the leadership and management lessons that I've learned have probably been the biggest parallel and you know you can use them whatever and i use them a ton in the rehab setting you know as you know mm -hmm. rehab facilities can get very hectic so having that leadership training and that time management training helps me to kind of calm down and be able to be an effective leader when i have 200 baby birds i need to feed or you know crazy amount of intakes coming in all at once that need help you know the those crisis management skills really come into play and i, I can see adapt that. them so and then you know being a fully licensed wildlife rehabber means that a lot of people look up to you whether it's volunteers or interns or members of the public so having that official leadership training and experience helps me to fulfill what i would say they expect of me and you know gives me the ability to be a good role model for them and you know that I want everybody to have when they go into the wildlife rehab field. Very cool. So, so what's the largest uh, fire you've fought here in Colorado? Uh, probably only about three, four hundred acres. Okay. Uh, it was like last month. That's and, that's um, still way more than I could do. <laughs> it, it wasn't easy. It was. It definitely tests you. Um, luckily, um, we have been able to keep all the fires pretty small, between five awesome. and twenty acres, but. Uh, with this uh, dry winter, we'll see yeah. We'll see what the summer holds for us. I might be making some good money. I'd much rather wrangle an angry bald eagle than, than firefighters. So, <laughs> so kudos to you. That's amazing. <laughs> In the moment, I would say the opposite. But, <laughs> but yes, I, I love both of them. I love being a firefighter. I love being a rehabber. I, I don't foresee myself giving up either of them anytime soon. That's awesome. Talon, we're just about out of time today. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this podcast. Of course. If our listeners would like to share this podcast, it is free and available for everyone. You can find this podcast and others on our website, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and more. Tell us what you think of our show by using the hashtag MyWildLifestyle and MyWildLifestyleRadio. If you would like more information on Northern Colorado Wildlife Center, you can visit their website at www.nocowildlife.org. If you would like to become a member and receive exclusive continuing education content, visit our website at www.rmwalliance.org. Also, stay informed and follow us on Instagram and Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Again, I'd like to thank our special guest, Talon Nightwalker. It has truly been a pleasure talking with you today. Um, thank you again for spending time with us and teaching us all about uh, what you guys do up there. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. I'm more than happy to share. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us for My Wildlife Style Radio. I look forward to bringing you more educational topics soon.